I recently made a video where we restored an IBM 330 P60 and we used it to play the original Grand Theft Auto from 1997. Today we are taking on its older big brother, the IBM 350 466DX2. This machine came to me untested and I didn't leave a note, so not sure yet what we're up against. The reason this IBM was left to rot in storage is because of this large gaping hole at the back. Luckily though, I found a missing bracket at computer reset. Where else would you find an odd part like this? In the 330 video I used an Aptiva display, because they looked like a pretty good match. However, someone mentioned in the comment section that these IBMs came with a G72, or maybe it was the G74, I'm not sure. Well, I snatched this nicely yellow G72 from my 300GL project. I guess we'll take care of it too. If all goes well, we'll try it out with a suitable DOS game. Okay, let's start with the display, because the sun is out and I want to do some retro bright while we take care of the 350. The G72 is a 17 inch IBM display and it's designed to run 1024 at 85 hertz. I wasn't able to find the service manual for this display online, but the screws seem to be hidden away behind these covers. Well, a soft prying tool wouldn't work, so let's try with a knife. Yeah, that seems to work. That was easy. Aside from being yellow, this case looks to be in really good condition. This display came untested too, so I don't actually know if it works. The stand seems to be locked in place with this tab here, and then it just slides off. The usual disclaimer applies of course. Don't poke around inside CRT displays. They may contain high voltages, even with a cord unplugged. The screws are making very loud crackling noises. So I don't think anyone has been in here before. The design of this display is a perfect match for the 300GL and PL. Well, that looks pretty good. At least the shield is very clean. And inside the case there is a minimal amount of soot. So we're off to a good start. By the way, you may have noticed the trash picked Sony Triniton in the background. It's still on the bench, because I want to fix that cataract problem, but I still don't know if I can do it safely. I've done some reading of course, but I can't find enough information to know if it's safe enough to do. I could only find one case online where it went terribly bad and the damn thing just imploded. But that guy was peeling off small pieces of glass, one at a time. So at least we know I'm not going to try that. I've seen it being done to much smaller and older displays. But no one seems to have tried to fix a 20 inch large display from the mid 90s. So I don't really know if it can be done. I think the shield is coming off. Well, not as nice as I was hoping for. This display has definitely seen some normal use. So there's a bit more soot inside the shield. Apparently this is a Samsung tube. Made in Korea. Can't see any date yet. Well, at least it smells nice. So we don't have to go extreme, as with a trash picked Sony. A quick cleanup should be enough inside here. The screws for the PCB tray are of different length. The design looks to be quite simple compared to the Sony, with just half a dozen of connectors and a couple of zip ties that I need to remember to replace. I'm skipping ahead here a bit because this isn't the main attraction. Okay, let's see if that was enough. Not quite. Ah, okay, so there is no connector on the neckboard. The neckboard has to come off. And now it's off. Next we have the control panel with all those adjustment knobs at the front of the display. It's held in place 
with a mix of screws and plastic tabs. So I guess we'll find out now if the plastic case has aged well. Well, the first tab didn't break. We we'll better take the tube out before we remove the main panel. Just the usual four screws, one in each corner. And tube is out. So the only thing left is the main panel. None of the clips broke. So the plastics have aged really well. Okay, that went really well. Aside from me having soot all over me. So I'll clean and retrobrite the case off camera. And I'll skip ahead here. Okay, moving on to the 350. Well, it's very similar to the 330. But it's quite a bit taller. So just like the other machine, it has this sliding door. This machine came with a CD-ROM drive and one missing front cover. The model number is 350-466-DX2. So it's quite safe to guess that this is a DX266. Inside the machine it's actually pretty clean. So that's a very nice bonus. If I'm not mistaken, with just one screw we can probably remove this entire bracket. The hard drive attached to it. Let's have a look and see what it is. It looks like a noisy quantum drive. And it is. It's a Quantum Pro Drive LPS, manufactured in May of 1994. It's a 270 meg drive with some IBM part numbers, so probably the original drive. And that's probably when this machine was made. So let's remove the riser board. It has four ISA slots and two PCI slots on this side. And one more ISA slot and a power connector. Just like the 330. And sure enough, that's a DX266. And one interesting thing here is this thing here. I think that's a slot for a voltage regulator. So there might be some interesting upgrades for this board. Actually, this board looks very familiar. Let me check something. Yeah, no wonder I recognized it. I think this is an identical board, as in the Aptiva we restored just a few weeks ago. I'll double check the part numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's identical. This board seems to have been upgraded twice, because these two sticks here have IBM numbers. And these are two different brands of sticks. And the power supply too looks very similar to the power supply in the Aptiva. So this is basically an Aptiva in a much larger case. And PCI slots instead of one VLB slot. Well, this could be interesting because the Aptiva wouldn't take a 5x86. So I guess we need to find out if this board can. Okay, let's see if this new bracket fits. Well, not easily. Ah, yes, it does. Awesome. Well, it's a bit tricky to install, but I think it fits. Well, that actually took quite a lot of fiddling, but eventually I managed to put all the screws in. So this was a really tight fit. But there you have it, Computer Reset just saved one more IBM. Well, as I mentioned, this machine is pretty clean, so we can put that riser board back in and reinstall the hard drive and move on to a test. Well, the display is left to dry after a reasonably successful retrobrite. So let's borrow the Flatron from the year 2000 Dream Machine and see if this IBM works. Well, the fan spins up, I can hear the hard drive and it posts. And we have a decent amount of RAM. Let's see where it stops. 32 meg, that's not too bad. That is a very slow post. I'm obviously skipping ahead here. But this is taking way too long. Okay, we've got an error. 1780 hard disk error. Let's see what we've got. Well, aside from the usual flickering caused by the camera, we've got a 486DX266. 32 megs of RAM, Cirrus Logic GD54X. Let's see what that is. Okay, I checked the chip on the motherboard and it's a 5430. 
We've got no cash on board. And the hard drive is recognized here, so I'm not sure what the problem is. Let's go to devices. Well, something might be going on here because parallel port extended mode is highlighted and can't be chosen. Let's go to ID drive setup and it's set to high performance. Not sure what that means. And if we go to start options, we've got first startup device diskette and second startup device is disabled. So this might be our problem. Let's set it to hard disk zero. Uh, we might as well, uh, we can't choose the seed ROM. So we'll leave it disabled. Okay, let's save this and exit. Uh, unfortunately, the CD-ROM drive is shot. I think it's stuck. Sounds like it's trying to eject. Uh, then nothing happens. So maybe if we're lucky, there is an interesting CD-ROM in here. Let's give it some help to eject. That's weird. That doesn't seem to work. Maybe that's because it's trying to eject. Yeah, it's definitely trying to eject. Let's turn it off. No, there's nothing inside here. How bizarre. Ah, here we go. Yeah, that is pretty firmly stuck. Well, I don't want to force it, so let's take it out. Well, there's only one screw on this side. So has someone been messing around with this machine? Well, to access the screws from this side, we have to remove the hard drive again with a large bracket. Uh, there's only one screw on this side too. Well, that's odd. Actually, this entire cage is loose. So, something isn't quite right here. We better remove the entire cage and have a look. I think that means we need to remove this screw here. And disconnect both drives. Let's see if it will come out. That was the only thing holding the entire cage in place. That means that someone has removed this screw here. So maybe someone tried to repair this CD-ROM. Or maybe installed it. Yeah, that is definitely not the original drive. This is an A-Open drive. Manufactured in September of 2000. Well, maybe we can fix it and use it in the year 2000 Dream Machine. But for now, I just want to see what's wrong with it. Well, I think the warranty sticker is still intact. It's hard to see because it's scratched up. So maybe we can get a replacement. That would be nice. A 23 year warranty. So I think we need to push this tab here to get this lid off. Well, unfortunately, no one left an interesting CD in here. But the CD now slides out, so it's not stuck anymore. Well, I can't see anything obviously wrong here. Well, there is no quick and easy way to disassemble this drive. So I'm going to leave it for now because this drive isn't going into this machine anyways. But before we replace it, let's just see if we can eject now with the lid off. Yes, it works now. So just removing the lid was enough to get it unstuck. So I'll put this drive aside and use it for another project. Uh, with the lid back on, it still ejects. So that's probably a working drive. Well, I found this nicely yellowed Sony 8X drive manufactured in 1996. That's close enough for me. We'll consider it as an upgrade before we put the cage back in. I actually have a blank for this machine. It's a leftover from the 330 because that machine came without a drive and we obviously installed one. So now we can use it in this machine instead. I didn't check but I'm kind of presuming it fits in this machine too. Well, it fits. Awesome. Yeah, we're in luck. That fits perfectly. Well, I managed to find a couple of spare screws. 
So we can put all four back in. Also, I don't think these screws are original, but I'm gonna leave them in. I'm also going to reinstall this missing screw here. It's not just holding the drive bay in place, but also the entire font panel, so it's kind of loose too. Well, the damn diskette drive is loose too, so I'll go ahead and replace these screws. We might as well. Well, the unthinkable just happened. I ran out of these small IBM screws. So we're gonna have to use generic screws. So where am I gonna find more of those? Well, I ran into the next problem. The tab I just showed you on the drive cradle corresponds to this hole here. But that is not a threaded hole. So that's very odd. Well, I took a closer look and I think there is a tab or something missing in that hole. I did however find this hole too. And that looks like a threaded hole. So perhaps this is what was meant to hold the front panel in place. So there isn't much we can do for the drive cage. But aside from this screw here, it's also held in place with tabs underneath. So it's not gonna fall out. But it is a bit loose. Okay, so the CD-ROM drive is actually connected to the same ID channel as the hard drive. But this board has two ID channels. I may be wrong here, but if I remember correctly, the CD-ROM drive will slow the hard drive down if it's connected to the same channel. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm going to add a second ID cable. Well, I found a cable that actually says CD-ROM on it. That has to be an IBM cable. Seriously? What's up with the length of this floppy cable? Okay, now I realize my mistake here. So this large bracket here has a tab that locks the drive cage in place. So with this bracket installed, the drive cage is very firmly attached. Okay, let's see if we can fix that hard drive. It tried to boot to a Windows 98 installation with some missing files. But that's okay, because I'm obviously not going to run Windows 98 on the DX266. But first, let's jump into FDisk and remove that Windows 98 partition. Okay, option number four, delete non-DOS partition. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, let's create a primary DOS partition instead. I just realized what we need to do with this machine. Why is it so stuck? Well, this DX2 has some bent pins. That is way too tight. Yeah, sure enough, some of those pins are pretty rough. We weren't able to run the original Grand Theft Auto in the PC330 in high color mode. So let's see if this machine can. And the minimum requirement for Grand Theft Auto is a DX4100. So these machines came with DOS 622 and Windows 4 workgroups. But on the DX4, we can go with Windows 95, at least for now. Oh, this motherboard only has one meg of VRAM and no sockets or pads for upgrades. So that could be a problem, but let's try anyways. Okay, let's install the original GTA. So this machine is obviously slightly slower than the 330, but it was suggested by several viewers in the comment section that the problem wasn't with the onboard graphics, but with the display. Uh, now we obviously have a much more modern display. This display here is from the early 2000s. But the other machine has 2 megs of VRAM, so I'm not sure if this is going to work. Okay, let's start by a quick test, just to see if it works at all. Oh, we've got no sound. Let's try to fix this. Oh, now we have sound. That's weird. I didn't actually change anything. I just restarted the game. Okay. Oh, that's a bit loud. Well, it runs, but it's a bit slow. Yeah, that is way too slow to play. Oh, that is slow motion. So DX4 
isn't actually enough to play this game. Yeah, there's no way you can play this game with the DX4. So that's a complete fail. Well, in that case, let's try with the 5x86. As I mentioned earlier, this board looks pretty much identical to the Aptiva board. And for some reason unknown to me, the 5x86 wouldn't work in the Aptiva. Let's give this a try anyways. Okay, fingers crossed. Well, the display turns on. And we have a splash screen. I don't remember if we got this far with the Aptiva. System board failure. Well, that's not good. So for some reason, these boards don't like the 5x86. But these boards have this weird connector here that is presumably for a voltage regulator. So there might be a way. So how about some cash? Maybe that's enough to make GTA playable. These modules are untested, but let's hope for the best. I'm actually gonna have to remove the RAM to access those sockets. Okay, let's give this a try. Fingers crossed. Let's jump into BIOS and check that cache. And sure enough, cache size 256k. So those modules seem to be fine. So let's boot and try again. Well, we sure have enough RAM. The system requirements is 16 megs. And it actually says on the box, one meg of VRAM is enough. And a 486DX4100. But it doesn't say anything about the cache. So let's hope we're lucky. Well, that's definitely quite a bit quicker. But is it quick enough? No, it's still a bit slow. Yeah, that is too slow. It is playable. But this is not good enough. This game definitely needs a Pentium. Yeah, this is kind of in slow motion. It plays, but it just isn't enjoyable. Although it's a bit easier to drive. When everything is in slow motion. Oh shit, I got stuck in the game right away. Well, I found a small pile of untested graphics cards. My collection of stuff is such a bloody mess. I'm busy making videos, so I rarely have the time to just test stuff. Okay, so what have we got here? GD5430. Well, these connectors don't look too happy. Well, I'll clean them off and we'll try this card. We better move that sound blaster all the way down here to the lower sockets and make some room for the Cirrus Logic but first some deoxid oh, that weird looking edge connector let's see if that stuff comes off yes it does come off not sure what that was probably oxidation but now that edge connector actually looks pretty good yeah there is some of that stuff on this side too not sure what it is feels like silicon well I'll clean it off camera Okay, nice and clean. Let's install it and see if this card makes a difference. I forgot to disable the onboard graphics and that's done with J15 here. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's hope this card works. Well, we're getting high voltage. That's a good start. And we've got a splash screen. Awesome, so that's probably a working card. Well, we have a minor change in the BIOS here. Instead of GD54X, it now says GD544X. So at least it seems to recognize the card. And I forgot to check before, but the BIOS also recognizes the DX4. And 100 MHz. 
Well, that's odd. It's asking for the drivers. But Windows 95 already has 5430 drivers. Well, I found the drivers on Vogons. Well, the files are on the diskette, so why isn't this working? What's going on here? Well, it works from the device manager, so that was just Windows 95 misbehaving. Okay, let's boots. And see how much VRAM that card has. I just realized that this display flickers like crazy on camera. Sorry about that, but my camera just doesn't sync with this refresh rate. And unfortunately, this card too only has one mega VRAM. Crap. Well, this is kind of pointless. Well, let's try anyways. No, this is about the same. Yeah, as expected, no change whatsoever. Okay, let's try something else. Well, at least I have a tested card now. So that's a good thing. This card also has sockets for upgrade. So I'll order some chips and make the upgrade. So how about this Creative Labs 3D Blaster Savage 4 CT7850. This card is way too new for this machine. But I just want to know what the bottleneck here is. Whether it's a DX4 or the graphics card or the VRAM. Okay, fingers crossed. Okay, we've got some errors in BIOS. Well, we now have 32 megs of VRAM. So that should be enough for GTA, right? Oh, check this out. We can change the refresh rate in here. So maybe I can get rid of some of that flickering. Yes, I can change to 60. I think my camera can do 60. 3D Blaster Savage 4. That's all I had time to read on that splash screen. Ah, uh, no, we're getting a PCI error. I guess that card is just too new for this board. Or maybe it needs some more power through that power connector at the back of the riser card. I still don't know what that connector is for. Okay, so how about this Matrox Mystique 220? This is period correct and a hell of an upgrade. Unfortunately, it's untested. I guess it will be in a minute. And by period correct, I mean a period correct upgrade, of course. I think this card is from 1997. So, pretty late upgrade. I think the IBM was made in 94. Okay, we've got a couple of errors. And this card has 4 megs of VRAM. So, let's hope this card works. Yes, I think it boots. It does. That is excellent. Well, that's actually pretty cool. I found the drivers on Matrox homepage. They still keep a copy on their webpage. That's awesome. It was too large to fit on a diskette though. So I had to pull the hard drive and copy the files from my modern machine. Okay, let's see if we can install this card. I think it works. By the way, this is the business version of this card. According to Wikipedia, it's identical to the non-business card. They were just bundled with different software. Okay, we've got a hardware conflict issue. Okay, it doesn't seem to play well with the onboard Cirrus Logic. So let's just disable the Cirrus Logic and see if this solves the issue. No, still a conflict. Okay, let's try to reinstall it and see if this fixes the problem. Well, I'm running out of time here and we need a happy ending. So let's hope this works. No, still a conflict. Why? What's going on here? Oh, by the way, I just noticed the flickering is gone. So that BIOS setting actually worked. The display is now running at 60 Hz. That is awesome. No, it doesn't boot the game. So how about if we uninstall the Sirius Logic card and then reinstall the drivers of the Mystique card? This is kind of odd because the onboard graphics are disabled with a jumper. Well, the display still flickers before it boots to Windows. And then it stops. Oh no, it installed the Sirius Logic card without allowing me to abort. No, we're still getting the same error. And it has installed the Sirius Logic again. Crap. Okay, I think we're finally doing some progress. First, I double checked the jumper J15. And it was set correctly. I then went into BIOS, but there is no way to disable the onboard graphics in the BIOS. 
So then I reinstalled Windows 95. But it just kept reinstalling the onboard graphics on every boot. And I had no way of stopping it. So now I have installed the game in DOS. Let's see if this works. Let's start with low color GTA. Okay, we've got the splash screen. And no sound. But that doesn't matter. I just want to see if it runs. I can always fix the sound later. Well, that looked okay. Oh, that actually made a huge difference. Haha. <laughs> yeah, that totally works. This is quick enough. Well, too quick for me, apparently. Because I just keep crashing. Maybe I'm too excited, because this is now actually working. Yes, success! So, that did the trick in DOS and with 4 megs of VRAM. This game actually plays well with a DX4. Okay, let's fix the sound. In the 350 video, I forgot to add a CD audio cable. But someone kindly reminded me in the comment section. Apparently this game needs that cable to play all the sounds in the game. Okay, let's install that sound blaster. Well, something just occurred to me. Perhaps the game was slowed down by Windows. That is actually quite possible. Okay, let's boot and see if we have a sound. Okay, let's choose the sound blaster in the settings. Yes, we have sound. Oh yeah. Definitely a difference with that audio cable. I didn't have this music in the 350 video. Okay, so for comparison... This is the low color mode. Pretty cool music in this game. Now let's try high color mode. And see if this works. We weren't able to do this on the 350. Okay, let's go. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. There's definitely a difference. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. It's not an extreme difference. Well, there's definitely more colors. And the game runs great on this machine, on the DOS. Especially with this graphics card. Well, my driving skills are still pretty crappy. So I need to practice. I haven't played this game in two decades. So I'm excused. Man, there's too much traffic in this game. And the game is, of course, a lot more enjoyable with the music. Well, I just completely ran out of time. I almost failed this week. So I need to edit and upload. But we're not done yet. We still need to figure out how to run 5x86 on these boards. And this game also has a 3D FX mode. So we're not done by far. Hit the bell icon below and set it to all if you want to join me in the next video. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. You guys are great, thank you for your support. If you would like to become a supporter of this channel too, you will find the link in the description below. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe and don't forget to leave a comment.